And with that, I will turn things over to Claudia and Katrina. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, if you didn't hear me already, if you would share what library you're affiliated with in the chat, that would be great. Um, we always like to see uh, where you are. And it's nice that people have turned on their webcams. If you want to do that as well, if you have one, I uh, would love for you to do that. Uh, I'm Claudia Holland, Chief of the Bureau of Library Development and the Division of Library and Information Services. That's always a mouthful. <laughs> it's really great to have you all on the call today. Um, today we're talking about established or even planning adult literacy programs and primarily public libraries. I'm really pleased to have several people joining us today um, to share their program practices and talk about some ideas on steps to develop or and sustain a, um, an adult uh, literacy program. Karen Strange is here with us. Wave, Karen, uh, from the Leroy Collins Leon County Public Library. And April Frazier and Amber Poole are here with us from Citrus County Library System. And I'm also very pleased to have um, a colleague, Katrina Harkness, who is BLD's Adult Services Consultant. And she's going to be talking about the Express Reads program that she's initiated here in, in uh, the, the division. So welcome, everybody. Um, we usually try to start off with some questions just to sort of get the conversation started. Uh, jump in anytime you'd like with any questions you have or antidote, anecdotes you'd like to share or antidotes if you'd like to share an antidote <laughs> you can do that too um, uh, we we really want your feedback and if if our conversation takes us off in another uh direction that's also fine as well these are really discussions for you all and uh, they are very helpful to us and how we can assist you in your work so let's start with a conversation tickler, um, something like how long, here's an easy one, how long have you had a continuous adult literacy program in place at your library? And what sparked creating this program? Anybody who wants to jump in, feel free. Citrus County um, started their adult literacy program in 2008. And it really just came from people in the community um, wanting to get their GED or learn English. Um, and so they were coming into the library asking for resources over and over again. And um, our one of our mission statements is to advance education in the community. And so we were like, well, this is one way we can do that. And um, I was not with the library system when that started, but that's kind of how it got started. And so now you have two people, you and Amber, who are doing this together? So no, um, I am our outgoing literacy services librarian. I'm actually now a branch supervisor and Amber is our incoming literacy services librarian. Hi but she is brand new and I wanted to introduce her to all of you. So I am just kind of here because she's brand new. So she won't have these answers quite yet. She'll have some of them, but not all of them. That's okay. Um, I mean, this group is, is also a support group. Uh, and of course you can contact us. And if we don't know the answer, which we often turn to the field um, and to people who really do, uh, you know, know up front, front line, what's going on. Uh, so, please feel free to contact us and congratulations, April. Uh, happy for you, we'll miss you in, in your current role, but I'm sure that's uh, exciting for you. Yes. So Amber, you're gonna be listening or you're going to be contributing too? Um, I'm gonna be taking notes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> awesome, okay. No, that's great. Uh, anybody else want to share where, how they got started? Um, I think the w here in Leon County, it's a similar story. They started though in 1982 and they had a partnership with, uh, which at that time was literacy volunteers. 
and that partnership lasted for a number of years but then it was dissolved a few years ago um, and so now the library has a standalone program adult literacy esl but it's same situation it started out first with adult literacy that was people wanting to improve their reading skills maybe get a ged and then it as the years went on they realized there was a bigger call for um, english english for speakers of other languages that developed and um kind of branched out from there <laughs> and uh -huh. so, yeah. so what happened with that partnership you had what what um well it just if, it started right before the pandemic and the library in particular just thought that it would be better to go off on their own the um literacy volunteers of leon county at the time just didn't seem to be as engaged as they had been in previous years mm -hmm. and the library director and the county they just decided to that it would make sense to just have a standalone standalone program. Yeah, it can be sometimes. I don't want to say more trouble than it's worth, but I, the, sometimes the reliability is not there that you need uh, to sustain a program. And, right. Yeah. Uh, that's hard, but I get it totally. Uh, I'm sure many of us have worked with volunteers, and although it's great to have volunteers in some capacity. If, if, if you're going to sustain things, really holding a paid person accountable <laughs> is the way to go. Uh, that just, just saying, uh, I might be wrong on that, but um, do others have uh, a, uh, an, a volunteer program that's working for you? Or do you have, um, are you just, using both a, 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 an individual in your library who's devoted to uh, spending some or all of their time on running an adult literacy program? Well, um, in our program, so I am a county employee, a library employee, and have been for 15 years. And um, so they just moved me into this position mm -hmm. from, well, they really didn't move me. <laughs> That's, I stayed in the same place, but just, just sort of took on a few more activities and we still have all of our volunteers. Um, they, I train the volunteers to work with the students, the learners in the program. Oh, so wow. it's, yeah, we've just sort of, I guess with dropping the literacy volunteers of Leon County, the nonprofit agency just sort of took out that, that extra board that I was see. there. Yeah. And so it's, now um, reporting directly to the library the, and also working more closely with the Friends of the Library Board. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so how about you all, uh, April? Do you all have? We work very much in the same way. So um, Amber is a paid county employee, mm -hmm. and then she will train our tutors to work with our learners, and she'll coordinate between the two. But the tutors do the work with the students. Yeah. So how many tutors do y'all typically have on, you know, working that you're working with? So um, COVID kind of yeah. did a number on ours as well. Um, so we're just starting to kind of build back up. Mm -hmm. um, I would off the top of my head say active right now, we're down to around 10. Mm -hmm. Um, some, I believe, are ready to come back. They've started coming into the library again and stuff like that. So Amber has been tasked with, <laughs> as she gets comfortable contacting those and seeing if they're ready to come back. Mm -hmm. But um, pre-COVID, I mean, we might have had 20 at the time. It had, it had gone down some even then. So um, we're really about halfway back to where we were tutor-wise pre-COVID. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, at this moment, have about 65 tutors. Wow. Yeah, and that's down a little bit from pre During the, the worst of the pandemic, the numbers did drop down to about 50, but um, I have a really good group of tutors, volunteers, a core group that they that's have cool. been with the program for a while, and I tried to jump in just as quickly as possible to get people to move online and to 
do alternative means. We had some tutors that were sending you know, packets of paper back and forth between themselves and their learners and that sort of thing, but um, trying to help people figure out a way to continue at least to some degree. I mean, the, the number of instructional hours, I think, dropped quite a bit during the pandemic just because people did not have the trying to do a, a lesson via zoom i think is much more mentally taxing than mm -hmm. doing it in person and some people didn't have particularly our learners a lot of them didn't have good technology to be able to do anything from home they were using their cell phones and wow. yeah yeah so you can imagine trying to do you know ged practice with a cell phone and a lot of them did it they did it but it was it's it's not easy and so our instructional hours i think more than anything dropped but they're building back up now and we're having more people that also meet in person again so do, do y'all typically meet in the library or, or do they or do they meet anywhere that's convenient for the student and the instructor or how does that work so we train our tutors to meet mostly in the library Mm -hmm. um, we have in the past said, as long as it's a public place, it can be somewhere else, um, just never in anybody's home. Um, but the majority of ours do meet in the library. So we have a couple, well, we have one tutor and one learner who are still meeting via Zoom. The learner comes in and uses a computer within our library system at our, our main library system mm -hmm. to be able to access Zoom. And then the tutor stays home because of her own personal health reasons she stays home so um it's worked <laughs> yeah. cool okay great I, yeah uh 65 that's a lot um <laughs> do you uh do you all have like a train the trainer program as well or do you karen in particular do you train all the incoming volunteers I work, uh, I do part of the training for, before the pandemic, I did all the training. Um, and during the pandemic, particularly pro-literacy and the Florida Literacy Coalition, they both really stepped up their online training modules mm -hmm. and other activities. And so I've been doing now a sort of mixture where I have people participate in either the pro-literacy training or a training via Florida Literacy Coalition for part of the training and then the rest of it is either meeting with me or part of the training has always been to I feel like particularly with the ESOL or the ESL that they need to see what other tutors are doing so some of the groups that we have we have some small groups I'll ask them to visit those groups and meet some of the learners in our program and see what some of the tutors are doing and things like that mm -hmm. so that's um but I did years ago um i've kept it up but the, the pro literacy uh organization they have a tutor training and i'm a certified trainer through them but it's my understanding they have now um dropped that and yeah <laughs> so i and they've said they're going to try and replace it with something else i'm not sure what but they haven't come up with anything yet so interesting uh, and ashley it's fine that you are here to uh to learn as well. Uh, you may have seen her uh, note in the chat. She's she's an incoming literacy coordinator um, and she's taking notes. So that's good. Welcome. Um, so do your libraries tend, and y'all please feel free to jump in if you have questions for uh, for the other um, people who are, who are sharing their um, uh, program plans and, and development, uh, feel free to jump in with your questions. Uh, um, Deborah Moore says we're hoping to start our program this fall. And Deborah, you're from New River, okay? New River Library in Pasco. Great. So you may have questions specifically for Karen, April, Amber, and whomever else on here would like to share. So do you all purchase materials specifically for uh, your adult literacy programs? Um, yeah, we do. We do. I have a budget for purchasing 
particularly consumables, we call it the some books that the students will use and then it'll be become their property. A lot of material that we have, they can we can recycle it through mm -hmm. other learners, but there's some things, some workbooks, for example, that it's nice for the students to have their own. Um, it's and we also uh, purchase practice GED test vouchers mm -hmm. um, through New Readers Press, we get the, which is the publishing house of pro literacy. And that's very helpful for the learners to be able to see you know, how close they are to being able to pass the GED. And it also gives them suggestions of things they should work on to, in order to improve their score. So do that. Excellent. But there's a lot of material that's out there that is available for free. Um, there's uh, reading for adults. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, April's probably familiar with that. And the, yeah, tons of reading material, all different levels, and that comes with quizzes and additional material. That's one of my favorite things to recommend to anyone, whether it's the adult literacy or ESL. But, and there's there's just so much out there that uh -huh. you don't have to spend a lot of money on books and materials. Yeah, I, I understand that the Florida Literacy Coalition has a lot of free materials as yes. well. Yeah. yeah, yes. Particularly, uh, we've just received, again, the Health Literacy Grant, um, and they have a wonderful health literacy curriculum that includes the books, which you can get the books for free, or you can get the PDFs and just print them as you need them if you want to. But they will send the books to you for free. And they have uh, now a health literacy app that's available for students and tutors. And it's also free. That's Florida Literacy Coalition is a great resource for the state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say we're, we're very similar. We don't have a budget for consumables. But we've had um, many donations in the past that have helped to increase our collection development for the literacy. We have a literacy section. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of resources for the tutors to use for their tutoring. Um, but consumables are mostly printed from online. They're free resources and things. Yeah. So ESL I Library is another good one. ESLlibrary.com. Yes. Love yes, <laughs> which they just changed their name, and I can I can't say it. I can't. Yeah. Il, il, Eli, Eli, I don't know what they're called. <laughs> Forget the acronym. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's just it's very it's E L and then two or three I's after it. I'm not sure how to say. Eli or e il, oh, yeah, sure. something. But it's a great resource, <laughs> no matter how you say it. Um, yeah. just wanted to mention too, Pro Literacy has every year also a grant that is a materials only grant. Oh. And you can apply for that. And um, we just got that one as well. And I got a thousand dollars worth of materials, books. Wonderful. Yeah, things like that. And um, that are going to be used. You just have to make a case for why you need it and how you're going to use it. And then at the end of the year, I have to give them a short report about what we did with the stuff. Mm -hmm. So, but a Is lot that, of workbooks and things like that. Can you apply for that every year? Um, every other year. Okay. I think is how that one works. Um, yeah, that one is every other year. But so this is, you know, it will be very helpful for us just to have a bit more of the workbooks in particular mm -hmm. that the students like. And um, so it just gives us a chance to spend a little bit of our actual budget on some other things, some of our wish list items that, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping to this year, um, we have a few students who are getting ready to take the GED and they just don't have the money themselves. It would be a tight squeeze for them to pay for the test. Mm -hmm. And so I've, we're going to use some of our funding to pay for them to take portions of the GED test. How much is that? Do you know off the top of your head? Um, I think one section of it is $32. Yeah, in Florida, yeah. it depends on also which state you're in, but Florida, I think it's 32. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 32 per subject, I believe 128 yeah. for the whole, all four. For the whole thing, yeah. yeah I see, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, that yeah. can get kind of hefty. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think someone doesn't have a GED or a high school diploma, they're probably not in a job where they're making great money. Right. Probably not, yeah. yeah. It's probably a, a, a true statement. Um, yeah. Katrina, I'm sorry. 
Did somebody want to say something? I was just going to add um, another materials grant you can apply for is through the Florida Literacy Coalition. They do, I think it's up to 500, but it's for tutor training. So oh. you can get lit starts um, to give away at your tutor trainings. You can get tutor eight. I think it's still tutor eight, not tutor nine. Um, and then there's ESL and literacy and math literacy um, tutor books. So. Okay, so so is this software and print? Or it is not. It's print materials. Um, okay. they're, they're books that actually come out of New Readers Press, I believe, except for Lit Start, which comes out of Michigan something literacy. And um, they're... They're good resources. Um, you just have to, and you can apply, I think more than once a year, but you just have to send in your training, like your flyer that's for your training. It has to be open to anyone. It can't just be for your local organization. Mm -hmm. And um, you just have to send like the evaluation, a report of the evaluations afterwards. So not the actual evals that you do, but just a report like 75% thought this was great, 45% yeah. thought this was awful, like whatever it is. So, oh, oh dear. <laughs> Katrina, do you want to talk a little bit about your uh, initiative? Sure. Um, so, just to tell you a little bit about my background, um, I'm new here as the adult learning consultant since October, but I've been with the division since 1999 as the education officer with the Florida Memory Program. And before that, I was a classroom teacher. So um, my, I'm very passionate about literacy, very happy to be talking with all of you here. And um, one of the things that I've been noticing has come up with people that I talk to is compared to um, teachers working with children, the resources that are geared towards adults are just not as extensive. There's just not as many options to choose from. So one of the things I'm working on putting together is a, um, set of resources at the library that can be borrowed and checked out for any library to look at to see, you know, if it's something that would meet their needs, you know, before they think about investing your own budget, or if you just want to borrow it, I'm thinking of it as a um, Airbnb for books, you know, our books can come and visit your library anytime. <laughs> and um, so one of the collections I'm putting together is the Express Reads. And most of the 62 titles in here right now are all from one publisher, but we'll expand that as we go along. And I'd love to hear from anybody about what they'd like to see expanded to this title, to these titles. Um, and these are uh, high interest uh, books. They're mostly mystery and romance genre um, aimed. They're designed for adult literacy learners, but there's also a wider audience. Um, I've been doing a little test drive around town, and I found um, it, they're also really good short reads for anybody that needs that for a variety of reasons. Um, I've actually had, uh, well, I'll start with myself. I'll be honest. Yeah. Um, I, um, I had sort of gotten through a period where I wasn't reading as much as I used to. I wasn't kind of finishing books and it was a real kind of hit to my esteem. I found a lot of librarians are really tied up in their, their view of themselves as readers. And to be able to sit down with a book and finish it in an afternoon made me feel like a kid again, where I would just, you know, immerse myself in a book until I was finished. And I loved that. Um, several librarians here have come up and sort of confessed that they hadn't been reading and have picked up some books. Uh, Sarah Shaw, I think over at Leon is one of the ones that did a test drive for us and finished some short books. I've also had a, um, a friend who's in her 80s who's had some health issues and had given up on reading. She was watching too, you know, a lot of television. She felt really terrible because she had a strong identity as a reader, but she just couldn't focus. And I, she's gone through a stack of six books now of this collection, has been wow. asking for more. Um, she got ready to, to return them to her daughter-in-law, who was hosting an exchange student, a 19-year-old who's here from Belgium learning English. And before my neighbor could return the books, the exchange student, the 19-year-old, had grabbed the stack and said, well, can I read these first before okay. you before you turn them in? So I'm trying to kind of grow that collection um, with the curb cut philosophy. Um, you know, the idea with accessibility with curb cuts is they are designed for a group of 
uh, wheelchair users or people with mobility issues, but they end up helping a much wider audience. And I, I feel like this, uh, these books, these resources can serve that same sort of purpose. They're really designed. And if you go to the publisher's website, there's a reading guide and, and they're leveled, the lex, Lexile levels, but they're, they're just really accessible for a wider audience. And I'm pretty excited about that idea. So those are there to share, please. I would love it if anybody would check it out, one out before even done talking. Um, if your library is on Flynn Share It, they're also available through there and really easy to get. And um, that's that program. So one of the uh, questions that's come, and I'm trying to put links into chat as people tell about their great resources, I'm trying to put those in the chat. So a couple of folks are talking about starting literacy programs. So I'd love to hear from Karen and Amber and April. If, um, if you're talking to somebody who's just getting ready to launch a program for the first time, where would you uh, recommend they start? What are the basics, the most important core elements to start with to make a program successful? Um, I actually wasn't part of the beginning of ours, <laughs> so. I would say um, start with your volunteers. You're going to need them. Um, you can't, you really just can't. I don't know about Karen, but I I couldn't have done my job and done teaching on a regular, consistent basis. It just, it's not possible. And so you need the volunteers. And so I would start with training your volunteers. I would contact Florida Literacy Coalition. They will send out a trainer who will come and train you and your volunteers for the first time and um, they'll send somebody to help you kind of start your program. And that materials grant from them for tutor resources is gonna get you that initial tutor training materials that you need. That would be my very first start. Um, because at the point that you've made the decision to do it, you should already know that the needs there in your community, which the needs in every community. I mean, yeah. our states, I think, third on the literacy, lowest literacy levels. So we're, there's not a community in our state that doesn't need this program. Yeah. So that would be where I would start is getting your, your volunteers and getting them trained. I agree. And 100%, that's the most important thing is having, a, having your volunteers feel like that they are at least somewhat prepared to handle whatever the situation is, whatever type of learner they end up with. And also, the only thing I would add would be to kind of plan for continued support of the volunteers. Um, make sure that one thing I've found very helpful is over the years is just doing quick surveys with all of the volunteers to see if, you know, just little check-ins to see how it's going, see if there's any material they would like to have, if they would like to do an in-service on a particular subject, that sort of thing, just to find out. And of course, with the individuals, you know, if they're tutoring one-to-one, -one, making sure that whenever they first start out with a learner, that they have the materials that they need and the information that they need about that learner, about their background, so that they can, they feel confident going into that first meeting. That's the only thing I would add in. Do many of these people, uh, these volunteers, do they take on more than one student at a time? What, I have, I have a few. Yeah, most do just have one. Um, I do have some tutors that do groups, so they have multiple learners in their groups. But I do have some that have more than one one-to-one -one learner that they're working mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. um, and usually it will be that they're working with learners that are very different. One may be working, you know, one of the students may be a high-level. Uh, very well educated learner they're working on citizenship for example and the other is a lower level learner they may be working on literacy type issues or math for the ged something like that so mm -hmm. that's with the one-to-ones but yeah we have right now i have 12 groups that meet and um yeah so the tutors they have anywhere from two to six learners in those groups mm -hmm. I would say the same. We don't have, obviously, because we don't have the numbers that you have, but we have um, several tutors who will work with more than one learner at a time. Um, sometimes they work with them together, especially with the English language learners. Um, if they compare them together, it's like a support system. 
Um, but if they're doing GED or adult basic, they tend to meet at different times, but they have some of them have multiple learners. Do uh, people on the call do and you all as well? Um, do you participate in the career online high school program as well? And how um, how do people typically decide, well, I'm, I'm interested in that program, COHS, or uh, GED? What, I don't know really much about the difference between the two programs. Um, can you share anything about that? We just started with the Career Online High School this year. This is the first time we've participated in that, mm -hmm. and uh, it's worked out pretty well so far we have a few students that are in the pipeline so to speak i have had some people though that they tried to do there's two parts to the program the career online high school and the first part um if they don't complete that with a high enough score within a certain period of time then they're not going to be able to progress to the next one to the next section and i've had some that just have not been able to do that and mm -hmm. so i've had my talk with them and directed them more towards the GED program because it is, it's not as, they can take their, take more time with it. Mm -hmm. And they will have a tutor that works with them one-on-one, -on -one, which I've given some the option with the career online high school as well, but they're also getting an online coach that is supposed to be helping them with that. So mm -hmm. um, I think the career online high school will require someone with stronger skills and with a bit more, um, uh, the ability confidence mm -hmm. that confidence mm -hmm. to be able to go on and sometimes uh, just some of the if they had a bad experience in school then that may not be appropriate they would just may not be able to handle it right now but we can get them going in with the ged and if they happen to pass a few sections of the ged and then they decide they want to try the career on the high school again they can do that and the tests that they had taken the portions of the ged will count towards their credits for the career oh. in high school. So oh. it's, it, yeah, so either way, it's not a loss to them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know, a April, you, you've you been doing that longer than I have. We have, so. this is our third um, time. So every time that it's been offered through the state, we've been a part of it. And um, a lot of what she said is I 100% agree. Um, but what I've found is so it says that you have to have a ninth grade or higher education, and it's very true. So if they've made it to that ninth grade and they're in ninth grade, they usually never struggle. Mm -hmm. um, but there's skills that are just missed if they weren't at that level. And just because they were in school in the ninth grade doesn't mean that they were at the ninth grade level. Mm -hmm. And so that's what that first few classes that they offer, it weeds that out. It gives a chance so that they don't get to the educational portion of it, if they're just in that career portion, it's a good chance to say, you know what, it's okay. This isn't for everybody. Mm -hmm. We have this pre-GED program that'll get you up to this level. Maybe we can try again for that. Or we have the GED program if you'd like to do the GED program. It's a good kind of jumping off point to tell them about the rest of the programs if they just can't do that. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, maybe that, you know, other pressures in life work whatever uh prohibit them from being on a faster track mm -hmm. as opposed to it sounds like what y'all are saying is that the gd program is more is much more self-paced mm -hmm. than the other uh so yeah so and you don't want people to feel like they're failing you, you know <laughs> i mean that's that's like deadly if if, uh, if you really want them to succeed yeah, the selling point on that is that it's it's not that they're failing, it's that everybody learns differently. Correct. And the yes. online environment doesn't work for everybody. And so that's usually how we nudge them over to the others. It's okay. okay. The, yeah. the GED is in person. You have someone sitting there with you helping you. It's going to go at your pace. You don't have to rush. You're not on a time limit. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, and the career online high school, I think they said you can, you should expect to spend eight to 10 hours a week. Mm -hmm. um, and some just don't have that time. They're, yeah, they're yeah. working two jobs and they have kids. They don't have, they're lucky if they have two or three hours a week to, to vote, yeah. to studying. So. Career online high school is really good for those who are either recently stopped out 
or who had all of the skills, just not the ability. Like we had a graduate, um, I just told Amber about this one, but we had a graduate, he, he was a local businessman. He owns his own business, everything. Mm-hmm. He, he stopped out of um, high school his senior year, one credit shy of graduating oh. because of his parents' divorce agreement. His father would have had to have paid for college and he knew his father couldn't afford college. And so he stopped out to prevent his father paying for college and always wanted to go back and never did. And so for him, he had all of those skills. I mean, he was doing accounting and everything. He had all of the skills. So it was an easy breezy. I mean, he was done. Plus their transfers credit in, trans, their credits transfer in. So that helped him as well. But, mm-hmm. um, but the ones who've really struggled, the ones who have the learning delays or just, um, they have the skills, they're just buried a little deeper, the GED route is a whole, whole lot more forgiving for them. Mm-hmm. So it's nice to have two options to, to provide to, to people, you know, uh, so I'm grateful for the career online high school program. And you, you know, I'm sure that y'all know that, um, the state did allocate or the governor, the legislature, whomever, <laughs> <laughs> did allocate more money for COHS this year. So a lot more money. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's like 2 million. So, you know, we're set for this year. And hopefully if, if we don't use it all this year, it can be carried over to the year after. Mm-hmm. Who knows? <laughs> I can't predict what the legislature is going to do, but uh, we do appreciate the support that they're providing. Um, are there any questions from the, the group that you want to bring up? Y'all are being shy. Uh, I, I would ask to, uh, do you receive any support from your local government or county government, you know, whatever government, uh, whatever body, you know, you, you um, are either governed by and your library system, or you've created partnerships with, uh, do you receive support from them? And I'm not talking just, you know, money's nice, but do you also, you know, uh, get support from your boards or from, you know, higher ups? Ashley, since you're new at this, I'm going to put you on the spot. So what, uh, what's making you all decide to jump on the, the bandwagon? Um, I'm not really sure. I haven't actually started the job yet. I start on the, um, the 25th. And so I don't have like a great understanding of what's going on there right now. Okay. Um, but I think it's just the fact that we haven't had a adult literacy program and they're really I guess they've decided that that's a need here which I mean obviously it is but they've really um become aware of a need and they're wanting to do that now so I'll know a little more about it once I actually get in there but okay. there's just not one right Great. Well, I'm yes, glad you're going to be starting this I can touch on that a little bit more as well Claudia oh, great. um great Susanna thank you <laughs> sorry I was late jumping on I went to went to lunch late and just got back no problem uh, so um, we had a literacy uh, coordinator um, several years ago when I first started and then that person retired back at the end of 2015 and we kind of weren't ever allowed to hire for that position again until recently. So we're just hoping to, um, to just to kind of start from the ground up, I guess, mm-hmm. with the literacy program, start building, building that program back up. So. Uh, that's why I suggested Ashley jump on this today. I thought she might get some good ideas and good information from everybody here today um, to, that we might could use going forward. Awesome. Uh, and Amber asked everybody, uh, where do you get your volunteers? And, and I, would, I would sort of expand on that question and say, how do you market your, your program to people who may be interested? How do you get the word out? What organizations do you either partner with or just have, you know, some sort of agreement with to get the word out? Um, Here in Leon County, we have a county 
department, Volunteer Leon, that they do a good job of, they have their own recruiting website mm -hmm. for um, all different types of positions within the county and other places. And so we're included with that. And uh, of course, here within the library, try and do some recruitment and wherever we can, <laughs> any <laughs> event, any type of uh, yeah, whatever, whatever kind of festival is going on, then we're there. Just last month, um, the local senior center had various events at different community centers, and we went to some of those and did recruitment, uh, let people know about the library, of course, and the services, but also to let people know about the adult literacy program, the ESL program, and that we're actively recruiting volunteers to be tutors and um, also here in Tallahassee, we have the universities and we have a community college and those have also been great resources for us mm -hmm. so, to get. Um, I have uh, some friends that work at the university and uh, one happens to be a professor for um, TESOL, teaching English. <laughs> and so she usually sends me at least a, an intern or so every semester, which is very convenient. Yeah. yeah. So. But um, Volunteer Leon, if your county has any type of volunteer organization, I know also they use Volunteer Match mm -hmm. is a website that's a, um, that's national. It's, and it's, as far as I know, it's also free to participate in. And um, you just have to come up with a blurb of the type of volunteer that you're looking for and describe what type of activities they would do, what type of commitment that you expect from them, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a few other organizations like that, like Volunteer Match, that you could also get volunteers from. Um, there's it's just a matter of getting the word out, and a lot of it is just word of mouth that yeah. you know, their friend is doing it, and they've heard about it, and they'd like to join us, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And high school. Um, service hours yeah the college students needing the community service hours absolutely high school it just uh i have had a few high school students that worked with adults in my program but they were very mature for their you know their high school age okay. <laughs> kind of thing mm -hmm. um and generally now if we have high school students that are just looking for community service hours i funnel them to we have a homework hub program which works with kids, helping them with their homework and school projects. But there are also some of the children of the parents in my program that are involved in the homework hub. And oh. so we send, yeah, so if we get volunteers from the local high schools that want to be tutors, we generally send them there and then they work with the kids. There. Awesome. Amber, we also have um, Nature Coast volunteer. If you get with Maria Rosinski, she can tell you more about that. Um, but we've done very similar. It's a lot of word of mouth, um, newspaper postings. Um, we have a relationship with our local newspaper and so they post stuff for us. Mm -hmm. um, just for free? Yeah, they post for the library for free usually. So um, it helps. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So. Free marketing is always good. Somebody is raising, oh, that's my hand. Uh, whoever is calling in, if you would put in the chat who you are and, and what library you're with, that would be great. Welcome, I'm glad you could join us. Um, let's see, so uh, Katrina, can you think of something that you would particularly like to bring up? Well, you had brought this up earlier, Claudia, and I think it's a, a great question. If you had unlimited resources, if you had a wish list and could just have exactly what you wanted for your library, whether that's materials or training or staffing, what would that be? With no monetary restrictions. <laughs> oh, thank you, Deborah. And, and just to put this in practical terms a little bit, um, 
we're hoping to get a learning management system within the next year where we can start to host some of the open educational resources that literacy programs use, some of the materials that they create if you want to share your materials with other um, other counties um, for free materials that that we create that we can add to um, from some of the things that we already have existing. Um, so this is in a way it's a pipe dream fantasy wish list, but I do hope to take the realistic pieces and and make it real so two separate pieces one something that we have in our learning management system, a bank of materials that anybody can use and share, and then also a sort of a literacy kit in a box. You know, if we can get recommendations for what are the best consumable books, what are the best, you know, non consumable books, what if you had just a list, you know, that you would hand you would want a beginning library to have or that you would want to be able to borrow that we can actually put into circulation and create kits for that's something I would love to do. So, so in a, in a just general sense, what would that be, but also as we're as we're building these resources really want some practical suggestions. One thing I have found very useful and all of the tutors find useful at some point is the Oxford Picture Dictionary. <laughs> yeah, and they have other materials that go along with the dictionary. There are workbooks that go along with it, worksheets. There's also um, a, you can create your own tests. They have um, a teacher's guide. They, and everything is correlated. So it's it's sort of a mix and match kind of thing. and it's. And we think of you know the picture dictionary, it's, but it has so many great things in it. Mm -hmm. And generally, I use the just the English version, but they also have versions in different um, languages: English, for example, English and Arabic, English and Spanish, and you know, English and French, whatever. And some of those can be useful for some of our learners, but almost everyone uses just the regular English version. Mm -hmm. and some of the materials that go along with it. Um, I imagine none of that is openly available free. It's, yeah. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. There are some online picture dictionaries that aren't bad, but nothing that comes you know, close to that Being entire worse, system. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's just, <laughs> I'm over here looking at it at the corner of my eye. It's <laughs> the Oxford Picture Oh, I said if I got stuck on a desert island, yes. And I had to, yes, I would take the Oxford Picture Dictionary. <laughs> yeah. um, I used to love those uh, Dorling Kindersley books. Yes. Um, you know, yeah. They were mm -hmm. a great publisher of illustrated uh, content mm -hmm. for young people, children, adults, whatever. Um, and if you have those in your library, they're they're great resources too. I think I don't mm -hmm. know if they're still around. Are they still around as a publisher? Yeah, yeah, they are. They are. They are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have some of their material. <laughs> um, yeah. One thing that uh, as your program grows, just finding a way to keep track of everyone. So. Um, <laughs> If you don't already, if you're not comfortable now using spreadsheets or using a database, maybe some training for uh, mm -hmm. doing that. Yeah, I, I have yeah giant Excel things that um, <laughs> yeah. keeping track of everyone. And yeah. uh, but you know that is something that it in order to get the funding a lot of times for grants and things like that, you have to have some way to track who is in your program, what their demographics or basic demographics are, and so a lot of times we don't think about that, but having making sure that you have time and if you need to pay for it, the training for your for the people in your program to be able to keep track of these things. Do you have to provide uh, private information too when you're applying for grants? Like you have this, you know, 65 volunteers. Do you have to? provide their names their addresses their phone numbers you know that kind of stuff no not that not to that degree but do you have to provide um for example with the the learners i will have to say what their demographics are where their what their native language is what their english levels are what their educational backgrounds are um how of course just the total number that we have and um so there is a lot just of information that you have to keep track of. Mm -hmm. And also with a lot of the grants, you have to do pre and post testing. 
So for the, the health literacy grant, for example, you have to do pre and post testing with them and you want to be able to have a good way to track that. Um, it's just makes your life a lot easier and also makes it much easier when it's time to do the reports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for most federal grants, I would say they definitely want to see uh, evidence in terms of data as to how successful your program is. And that's, I think, April, you referred to that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so starting off collecting data, get used to it, just do it. <laughs> um, you'll, you'll be glad you did. Uh, so, you know, playing catch up, you know, is, is not fun. Uh, and, uh, and plus, you know, even if you have specific questions that your grantor requires, that you ask, that doesn't mean usually that you have to speak only to those questions. You can ask, you know, your own questions as well. Um, I, that's just typically how um, most grantors, you know, the strings they attach, shall we say, to the money that they're giving out. And you can't blame them, you know, for wanting to, to see evidence of the impact that they're having on your local community or, or whatever the case may be, your county, um, that kind of thing. So what, other than COVID, we'll end on this note maybe, other than funding and other than COVID, what have been the greatest challenges you've had or have there been any in, in offering this um, service to your community? So, our community, the way it's spread out, we have five libraries across the county. Um, we're an extremely rural county, um, mm -hmm. so we're very spread out. So when our volunteers do sign up, a lot of times they'll only work at one branch, but the learners that need the help are at a completely different branch. Uh -huh. And so we wind up with volunteers who are waiting for learners and learners who are waiting for tutors, but we can't fix the problem because... Yeah. So sometimes the learners can't drive, they don't have a vehicle, so they can't go to the other side of the county to um, do a tutoring session. They could take public transit because we do have, gratefully, even though we're a rural county, we have a bus that goes from all five libraries all day long. Wow. But they can't take the bus because it might mean that they have to get there two hours early and leave an hour later and they have to get to work. And mm -hmm. so it could, that's our our biggest issue is having learners who are waiting and tutors who are waiting. And it looks like, well, you have 10, you know, let's say right now we have 10 active tutors and we have, you know, 15 learners. And of those 15 learners, eight are waiting. And you're like, but you have 10 tutors. Why yeah. can't you? <laughs> There's yeah. nothing you can do. Yeah. That would so. be challenging. I think that's a problem with every program. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we have that too. I just so they're trying to figure out, okay, how can I get these to work? <laughs> yeah. Or the times are not quite right. The yep. you know, the learners, they're working, they could meet in the evening, but the volunteers, they're they want to meet in the morning or they want to meet at lunchtime or or it's yep. or they're doing yeah. ESL and this learner needs adult basic or they're it <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. it just, it, it does feel like you're trying to, it's like the game with the, you know, the little ball that has the, the, the circles and the it's little things you have to pound through. Yeah, it is. It's hurting cats. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Ah, I yeah. apologize. I do have to jump out. I have a Lego literacy club at four oh. o'clock. So well, go. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Well, we're, we're about at the end anyway, but thank you, April uh, and Amber and Karen. And Katrina, uh, it, does anyone have any questions or things they just want to talk about in the last five minutes that we're together? I saw in the chat that Katrina had asked about the pre and post tests. Oh. And, and just with the Health Literacy Grant, the it's a uh, the Florida Literacy Coalition. They have their pre and post tests that we, we use. Um, otherwise, just for the program in general, there's other there's several tests that are available um and they're not free maybe to get to begin with but uh the ones that i use they once you buy once you buy the material then you can just use it over and over one is they're through pro literacy it's the um ESLOA test and it's just a flip chart test i'm trying i was trying to find my oh, there it is okay 
like this. And it's just a, this is for the, the English for speakers of other languages. And it just has um, a drawing. And then you ask the learner a question. So for example, this one, which child is behind the playhouse? And you ask them and it has the answer on the back. Oh. <laughs> so, but anyway, so this, and then there's also the, um, the read test, which, uh, or also, uh, April was talking about the uh, Lit Start book and Lit Start also has a literacy pretest and you can also use it as a post test um, or you know interim test for your learners and that one I like that one because it has it in different levels you just have you start out with a basic literacy do they know letters and numbers and then it goes on to reading passages and just different levels of reading passages and once you get to the point where they start stumbling then you stop and oh. then that kind of tells you which level they need to begin at and that's um lit start is the lit it's a book start. lit okay. start yeah okay. and um I'm trying to think one second you didn't get it <laughs> he's a visual person i can tell i think oh, well, there it yeah. is <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, and it's um, through michiganliteracy.org. Michiganliteracy.org. Okay, awesome. Put that up there. I don't know if you can see that. Great. Yeah, um, that's the book, and then there is the 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 little test that goes along with it. So, and it tells you it it walks you through how to do that that assessment. It's anyone pretty much could do it as far as administering it and again these are ones that you do one-to-one -one with the learners mm -hmm. um yeah okay. awesome well i want to thank everyone for joining us today and particularly karen and amber and april who had to jump off and people who are learning and katrina is it's been great um, as I think Amy uh, mentioned, this recording will be available on our uh, BLD's YouTube channel uh, pretty soon, probably tomorrow, knowing Amy. Uh, we'll be sending those of you who registered and even those people who weren't able to come the uh, link to the recording, as well as a brief survey uh, for those of you who are able to attend. Um, about this session. We hope you'll take just a couple of minutes. That, that's our evidence on what how we're doing. Uh, and um, June's DLIS discussion topic is the Florida Braille and Talking Book Library. We'll be sending reminders out uh, via the Building Success newsletter on our website, social media, you know, the whole, the whole bit. Uh, so please think about joining us on uh, June the 20th from three to four. Uh, we usually meet the third Monday of the month, unless there's a holiday. Um, if you have a topic you'd like us to discuss or you just wanna bring it up, uh, please shoot me an email or just bring it up at the next uh, DLIS discussion. Until we meet again, uh, be safe, be healthy, and thank you all so much for spending time with us. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to Ken, uh, Karen and Amber and April. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you for doing this. This was fun. <laughs> Bye, Ashley. Take care. <laughs>